everybody, and thank you for giving up your Saturday morning on, in paradise here at our wonderful community. Uh, we are going to present to you today everything that we have been doing and are doing and will be doing or hope to do uh, to improve the residences. And do you want to introduce yourselves? Okay, and then Eric will talk for a bit, and then Jeanette, and... So I'm uh, Eric Faubert, part of the board. Jeanette Stone. I'm De Denise Treza, or D. Treza. Rob Whistlow, good morning. So like Fran said, it's like uh, we're here this morning to uh, give you, uh, for the first time at the residence, uh, an overview of the current situation of the building from the outside, which you can see, and from the, uh, sorry, the outside, what well, you can see, from the inside, what well, you cannot see. So uh, we have worked hard since we got elected last April to, uh, to assess the situation, to do analysis of the future of, this, of this, those buildings. Uh, we went through a selection process for an uh, uh, engineering firm, which we'll, uh, we'll go ahead with uh, further with Sunisa from Falcon. So Billy will explain the entire process we went through. Uh, we're pretty excited to present you what we have. You will see that we have a lot of work to do. It's going to be a resume today. Uh, after this meeting, that's why we're doing a videotape. So uh, all the owners who cannot attend today and the other resident will be able to see the video. We'll also provide on the website all the detailed document that we got from, uh, fa from Falcon, the elevators report and everything. Everything will be available for you to see the entire detail. Because if we present you the entire detail this morning, we're going to be here for two days. Okay, so, <laughs> so we'll try to do it in two hours. So uh, that was the message this morning. So, Janet. We're going to be handing out some folders. Yes. Um, if you can share with your husband and wife, because we only have uh, like 50 of them. Um, everything, like Eric said, everything is going to be on the website on Monday morning. The presentation, um, we have an electrical assessment. We also have a mechanical um, and, and, and plumbing um, assessment as well. And we have two reports. We have a report that was done back in 2008. I'm not sure that anybody was privy to that report, but there was a report from 2008 that we just got um, about two months ago. And then the current report of 2018, okay? All right, the procedure, the procedure is going to be that if you have questions at the end of each section, this is Billy Coleman. He is the operation, director of operations for condominiums uh, in the region for AMP. And Sunisa works with Falcon, and he is also an engineer. And Ayub Sheikh also works for Falcon, and Falcon is the overall uh, contractor who's doing everything. So what's going to happen is at the end of the section, if you have questions, you'll come around here to Mike, who has a mic, and you'll speak to, you will have a mic, yeah, but you, they, yeah, um, and ask a question. If you don't need the mic, then it makes it easier for us, just yell, okay? Good. And the reason we're asking you to come up front for the question is because in order for uh, record everything, uh, and in order to be fair to all the other owners, I uh, would like just you to come uh, in front and, and ask your question. Okay, so every subject will take a pause to uh, allow you to ask your question. Billy, that's your turn. Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for having us today. Um, it's a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, my name is William Coleman. I go by Billy. I'm the Director of Operations for Atlantic Pacific Management. Um, I'll be doing a good portion of the presentation today. And we also have Shanisa Kohler, who's the Vice President of Falcon Engineering. Just to go over a quick agenda before I do that, I'm going to apologize. I kind of move. And so if you start throwing things, I'm a little harder to hit, okay? So I apologize about that before. All right, um, from an agenda perspective, and if you look in your package, you're going to find that the PowerPoint presentation that is being presented today is in your package, as well as a one page back and front um, project overview. I'm going to go through the details of explaining what that project overview is and how it will be utilized as we go through the project to keep you updated um, once we get to that point. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that the PowerPoint presentation was actually in your, actually in your package. All right, today's meeting agenda. 
The first thing we're going to discuss today. I don't need this. Sorry. All right. The first thing we're going to discuss today is company introductions. That's going to give you an overview of who Atlantic Pacific is, as well as um, Falcon Engineering. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to give you um, introductions of the teams from both of our organizations that um, will be working on the project. We'll go through and give you the project overview, and I'll explain the document that's contained in your package. Shanisa will give you his building assessment um, presentation, which basically outlines all of the components of the building from a structural and mechanical perspective. We'll then go into the elevator uh, assessment that's been complete and where we are with that. And then our famous turtle lights. We'll go into our friends from the beach that can only deal with certain type of lights or they go the wrong direction. And then finally, we'll give you a quick overview of what the next steps will be and when you can expect to see certain information, certain meetings, and that type of thing as we progress. All right? So right now, I'd like to turn it over to Shanisa to give you a little bit of background on Falcon Engineering. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sinisha Kohler. I'm a vice president of Falcon Group. I'm a structural engineer by trade and licensure. And uh, I was a, a member in charge of, uh, uh, of the entire engineering overview uh, that uh, Falcon Group, the company that your board selected for this particular project or projects, have performed so far and continues to perform. As you can see, I don't, do not move a lot. Therefore, if you throw something, I'm easier to hit. So uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I apologize. I learned that I have an accent. So if somebody doesn't understand something, please raise your hand, and I'll repeat myself. Uh, so Falcon Group is an a, a all engineering company. We have all trades on staff, meaning structural, electrical, mechanical, architectural, civil. So we have all of the engineers on staff. We don't sub any of the work. Uh, we have been in, year, uh, in business actually 22 years as of, uh, of uh, Thursday of last week. Uh, we have multiple offices. Our headquarters are in New Jersey. Uh, the Miami office has been the youngest of the offices, but it's been the, uh, the office with the most growth. And currently we have uh, 21 people working in Miami, working on multiple projects similar to, to yours. Uh, we are a forensic engineering company, so our so uh, uh, work is working with associations like yours, helping them throughout various stages of a life of association. We are somewhat, sometimes involved from the beginning, from the construction, through a turnover process, then through a maintenance of the building, and sometimes, unfortunately, when there is a, a, a legal aspect of life of the association, we get involved there as an expert uh, engineering uh, uh, witnesses. Uh, the team that was involved, uh, uh, obviously the, the, one of the principals of the office, Mr. William Peisner, who is the, uh, one of the owners, one of the three partners of the company, he was the uh, you know, man on the top, uh, the, the umbrella over all of us. I, um, as you can see, that's how I spell my name, by the way, just in case anybody wondered. Uh, uh, I was uh, in charge of the team that was on the, on the ground working on this project. I apologize for misspelling Mr. Ayub's name. It's not Ayub, it's Ayub. Uh, 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 he is our senior mechanical engineer. He was in charge of the mechanical electrical aspect, along with uh, Mr. Reza Kusha Mirsadi, who is electrical engineer. And then we had uh, a, a couple of our engineers that were doing the field inspections and, and prepare in, uh, helping in preparation of the report. Mr. Sergio Gonzalez, Eder Kiroz, Isandela Gosto, Brent Houghton, and Philippe Perono. Um, uh, Atlantic Pacific Management is the management partner for the association. Um, the on-site team that works for this association and also will work with the project is myself, William J. Coleman. I'm the director of condominium operations. Um, Sherry Verrett, who is our senior regional director, I'm sure a lot of you know her. Uh, Julio Chiroldes, who's not here today, but he's our regional chief engineer and functions as somewhat of an overview of um, our maintenance departments and our projects. Steven Zamora, who's your on-site manager, and I apologize if I butcher the name, but Ertin Abdobaki is the chief engineer. I hope I got that close to right. <laughs> Fantastic. 
fantastic. Um, Atlantic Pacific is a fourth generation family owned organization. Currently we have about 150 properties that are uh, made up of multifamily communities, commercial, and our condominium division which is about 90 strong in, South, in Florida and California. Um, we have about 1,500 employees and th 3,600 units. Predominantly, um, your home is our business. So the thing that we try to do is ensure that whenever you have major things go on in your association, they're handled in a way that is transparent, that is educational for everyone to understand what's going on, and that optimizes the dollar spend without inconveniencing you um, to the point of going crazy. To that tune, I'm going to speak to the project overview. I'm going to step up here. Um, when we started this project, we put together kind of a project overview that gave us goals and objectives on how we would accomplish what we needed to do. Originally, we started, and this is in your package, some of them I'm going to read and some of them I'm going to skip through, but we started with the idea that every structural, electrical, mechanical component of the association had projected useful lives. For example, nothing here is going to last forever. The visual deterioration, recurring breakdowns, code upgrade requirements, etc., are all signs of components reaching the end of this useful life. So we could easily observe that there were issues. Um, many of the components were critical repairs or either were unhealthy work, um, unhealthy environments. Um, one of the things when we started the project was to identify the immediate needs, the urgency, and to have a plan that consisted of the following values. Each project should, have, should be founded on values of transparency, fiscal responsibility, communication not only between the teams that are working every day, but predominantly with the unit owners and the residents of the building. And then once you establish the process, trust it. In other words, don't consistently get in the way of something that was built from the beginning because it's just going to cause problems throughout and friction. So we started with those values. And for the most part, we wanted to determine the why, what, when, how much, and how long it was going to take. Well, how were we going to do that? So what we did was we developed a plan. All right? And predominantly, this plan is in phases, but it ultimately accomplishes certain targets. And the first thing we needed to do, which is in phase one, was identify the building components that had issues. So as you walk around as a layperson and you see concrete spalling or um, visual problems, mechanical equipment that's failing, those are easy, easy things to identify. So we could put together kind of an overview of what our expectation was the project was going to be. So that when we started talking to professionals that were going to help us truly identify the deficiencies within those components, we actually knew what we needed them to do, at least in general. So we put together a relatively long project plan, which um, I believe in your package you'll see this document. Okay, this document. All right, and as you'll see, you'll see the beginning of what the RFP request for proposal to the engineering partners were provided. It essentially gives the engineer a list of components, very general and broad, for them to bid on. And then you go through a process of how to select that particular professional engineer. The board of directors engineered quite a few engineers um, looking for the partner that best fit the needs of the association. Not necessarily the cheapest and definitely not the most expensive, but the one that could actually do the job. Fundamentally, that's the best way to be successful. Choose the best partner, then work out the cost. So the association identified all of those areas that are in your package. All right, <clears throat> and then that was passed along to the three, maybe four, engineering partners that they interviewed. All right. So if you look at the next page, you'll find kind of a history of all the different meetings and time frames and how they went through kind of a, a, a high 30,000 square foot picture of what the board went through to kind of select the engineering partner. And we had on July, on January 3rd, 2019, um, the formal presentation by the professional vendor partner of the deteriorating problems in the bot property, which ultimately led us to where we are today. So if you look, I think this will work. Nope. 
the vetting of the professional vendor partner to perform the evaluation, solicitation and review of the proposals, presentation to the board, and ultimately they selected it. And then you have the evaluation by the professional vendor partner um, that was provided earlier, presentation of evaluation report to the board at membership, which is today. You're gonna be presented the entire report that the engineer actually put together today. You'll see a very in detail um, description of the items. You'll see pictures, et cetera, and it's also available on the website. Then our next steps in the project plan will be the preparation of the scope of work. So what the engineer does is he goes out and he does an inspection of the whole property. He identifies all of the components that are not in a position of health. And even if it is, he'll still tell you how old it is and how much life it has left. And he puts together a very long report. After he puts together the report, it basically identifies the components that need to be addressed within a short amount of time. Once he gets that deficiency report, is what it's called, put together or an assessment, then he presents it to us and we decide to let him go on and put that into a scope of work that can be bid out. To bid out large projects or complicated components, you have to have the specifics of what needs to be done. For example, painting this building is not just painting this building, right? You have to know that there's gonna be concrete spalding in different areas. The areas that are the flat face of your balcony, if you look over, that's one price versus the flat surface of the building is a different price, all right? And what you do is that scope of work actually builds in all of the categories of each job that need to be bid so you develop unit prices. And then an estimate of the quantity and that's how you get to the total. So he is building currently, or after today, the scope of work for all the different things that he'll present to you. Once he builds the scope, then we send him to any vendor that can qualify to bid on those jobs. So the board hasn't yet determined what the qualifications are going to be, but we've discussed guidelines such as bid bonds, which a bid bond is basically to be able to bid on the job, you have to be able to bond it to a certain level of the estimated price. For example, if it's $100,000 and we put a 5% 5 5 bid bond on it, you have to have $5,000 in a check or insurance to be able to bid. Now, if you think of that in a larger scope, for example, I'm gonna use real round numbers, let's say $100 million, okay? That means you would need $5 million of a bid bond to be able to bid that job, right? If you can't put up $5 million, you can't bid it. Now, what does that do? That ensures that you have adequate cash flow and adequate uh, substantial financial position to where you're not going to run away and just take the money for the association. That's one of the criteria of bidding. Once the bids are all received, they are received closed. Nobody up here, nobody out there, and no one but the actual vendor will know what the bid is in that envelope. The envelope will be opened live and in person in this room in front of anybody that's here. What that does is it eliminates any can, it, it eliminates any preconceived notion of people sharing numbers and you know making things up, which we like to be as transparent as possible because ultimately it's the best way of doing things. Once they open the bids, Shanisa will take them all and put them in a big comparison. Basically, it takes everyone, makes sure it's apple to apples, and then presents it to the board of directors as these are the final bids. After that, maybe shortly before that, we'll start working on a financial plan. How are we gonna pay for this, right? How are we gonna pay for this? Now, this is what I do. I have about $100 million in projects going on right now, and every building is different, right? It depends, is it $100, is it $1,000? What, what is the ability of the unit owner to be able to pay for it? Do some wanna pay it all up front? Do some wanna pay it over five years or 10 years or whatever it may be? Those are the things that are determined as we go through this process. And being able to stand up in front of you and discuss these things with you give us a better feel of what you will need based on what the number is from a financial perspective to be able to take care of the responsibility. Then once you get that done, then the professional construction people come in and they do their presentations in front of you, right? They come up and they tell you that they've done all this work and they did, you know, Parker Dorado or 
The Diplomat or Ocean Palms. And ultimately, you'll select one of those construction companies to be your construction professional vendor. Then you'll negotiate the contract, finalize the contract, and start the project. Does anybody have any questions about kind of the overview of how this works? No? Yes, sir. Hold on. Yeah, I'm sorry. You have to. You have to. Or I can just hand it to him. My question is, uh, in process of negotiation, uh, did you uh, make in contract some penalties when a contractor doesn't do job on time? So I'm going to repeat the questions just so everybody hears it. He said, in the contract, do, is there language that has a penalty for um, not completing on time? In the, well, I'm not the attorney, and I'm not the engineer. Usually the engineer and the attorneys are the one who works on the contracts, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, it can't be a penalty legally. Um, Legally, it has to be liquidated damages resulting from a breach of contract. Um, usually, we do build in those numbers. Uh, it's a little less linear depending on the conversation about how strict that time frame is. Um, contractors are afforded additional time based on hurricanes, et cetera, so those come through change orders. But um, the negotiation of the contract and how well we can position ourselves to protect that liquidated damages um, date will be a topic of conversation in front of everybody so everybody understands it. Um, I can tell you, my, the projects that we work on, I, I don't think, they usually don't go too far over. Maybe a month or two, but not really much. So I, I can't, I don't have one that's went more than two months longer than the schedule. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Hold on. I'm going to come to you next. I'd like to know why we don't have the open bid ourselves in front of us. Yes, yes, yes. So, so let me just repeat the question and then make sure everybody answered. She wants to know why you wouldn't have the bids open in front of everybody, and I told her that that's what we're going to do. Um, all the bids will be delivered closed, and then we will have a meeting just like this to open them. So nobody will know what's inside the package prior. The second question is why you don't bring the street uh, bidder in front of us in a podium? Yeah, we are. We are. Yeah, that's part of the process. The process is, is that when the contractors are being interviewed, those interviews will be, the presentations, will actually be presented in this room for everybody. And it won't, um, it depends, but most of the time we do it with a town hall meeting very similar to this forum so that um, everybody's kind of the same, and we make sure they have 30 minutes, they do a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the board doesn't necessarily say, you know, this person's $100, I like them, it's more, this was the best person to select, and then we negotiate the price. I do want to clarify that the board, the, the board and management get a copy of the proposals also separate from the opening of the uh, well, hold on, hold on. Uh, not usually before they're opened. So we don't want the board or management, or anybody for that matter, to actually be able to see the proposals prior to them being opened. So there, the actual RFP that will be put together actually says that it has to be delivered um, hard copy, envelope closed to a specific location. <clears throat> yeah, the email is usually the next day after we open them, but Shanisa will put it together. Maybe Shanisa, I really, I, I'm a little skeptical. It depends on how you guys are, but I'm a little skeptical of the process. I don't like anybody having access to the numbers prior to the day of the meeting, um, but, you know, that, that's up to the board of directors and Shanisa. By the way, guys, my name is Christopher Nips, uh, Unit 1231. Um, the... I have gotten a copy of the request, and it does go to, it is requested to go to management as well as board, uh, showing numbers and pricing full proposal, as well as a full, okay. I, I no, 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 for the construction, from the construction company, he hasn't done that package yet. The construction just that in certain, at least, at least some type in certain packages, it is. Oh, I, the lighting with her, for the lighting, mm -hmm. it was requested. So even though we'll open that up today, no, we're not doing that today. So, right. Okay. 
in this, for this project that's being presented today, which is the structural components, the mechanical components of the building that Shanice is preparing the scope of work for, which hasn't even been bid out yet, that will not be possible. It's too big a number. Okay. Just to clarify why sometimes it's done the way and sometimes it's not. Uh, usually, that depends on, and I'll, I'll use this word in, in uh, please, how paranoid all of us are. Uh, so if you believe that management, board, and engineering are in cahoots with anybody, then you want the sealed process, and just for everybody's peace of mind. However, the problem with, for example, Turtle Lights was that we are under a very tight deadline. We didn't have a lot of time to go to the whole process, and given the cost of the project and necessity to finish it in a, in a very tight deadline, we opted out to go for a more open uh, a bit uh, process just so we can collect information sooner the engineer has an opportunity to bring those comparisons sooner to the board so we can make a selection faster and get the project before the deadline. So that's the only reason. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a very general question. I'm still trying to understand the roles of different people here. There is a board, there is a management, there is Falcon Group, and there is Atlantic Pacific. Are you a consultant? Are you a general contractor? What is your responsibility? What, you know, just a little confused, that's all. Sure, no, no, no. You only have, today, you only have three entities here, okay? You have the board of directors, okay, which represents the association. You have myself, Bill, William Coleman, that is the director of condominium operations for Atlantic Pacific, your management company. Okay, so, so Stephen and Sherry, that team works for Atlantic Pacific. And then you have your professional engineer, which is Falcon Engineering. To give you an idea of our roles, okay, Falcon, is, as a professional engineer, does essentially three fundamental things. I'm being very general and very macro, but three fundamental things. The first thing they do is an evaluation of your building. They go through and they inspect all of the structural and mechanical components of the building. And they put together a report on that. Then they create a specification, right? That is, the specification is used for permitting and is also used to be able to solicit bids from contractors. The third thing that the engineer does from a macro perspective is project management and inspections while the work is going on, potentially. So that's not always, but that's kind of how sometimes, most of the time it works. Um, but they go through and they do the inspections as the permit for the permit process and to validate the pay applications that your contractor will submit during the course of the project. So for example, the pay applications from a contractor perspective will say, I did 10 feet of concrete stucco, right? The engineer has to come up when he gets that pay app, and usually before, and look and say, yes, he did 10 feet of stucco, 10 feet of concrete. And then he signs it. And that signature is acknowledging that the work was done and taking liability for any stuff that potentially wasn't done, which doesn't really happen often, or if it was done incorrectly, right? Um, then we pay him. Now, the board, as a represent representative of the association, will make the decisions how the project moves forward on things like, do you want red or blue? Do you want green or yellow? Do you want to do this? Don't you want to do this? Do you want to change this from this to this to this? Now, th those decisions are more complicated in some ways because some of them may represent what is called a material alteration. If they are going to change what the property looks like in any way, shape, or form, all right, if they want to, they can't just arbitrarily go out and say, we're gonna change the building from white to pink. They can't do that. They have to ask you permission to do so. By doing that, you have what's called a membership meeting. At the membership meeting, you have to have a quorum of residents present in person or by proxy, and then a certain number of those present in person or by proxy vote in favor of the material change. But we'll go through that. So you're going to see a very, I'll say, meticulous process of how this project goes from today to completion. When the project actually starts, there are weekly construction meetings 
also that are open. So you can always get an update if you want to. There'll be project update reports that are provided via email so you'll know the things that are going on. This is gonna be a time for you as an association because the board of directors is being very diligent um, and responsible on how they want this project approached to where the information that will be created and distributed will be very thorough so you understand the process all the way through. Um, I must compliment them on the process that they're going through. It is very thorough and they work very hard, I must say. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, let me... Yeah, I, sort of about the experience. I just wanted to know if we would cover today um, what the ETA for completion would be, what the experience of living here while construction is ongoing would be, and whether the amenities would be sort of alternated in their uh, renovation so that there are always sort of amenities available. Thank you. That's like pool. Um, in general, we will give you um, dates for the process, um, they will be a little conservative so that you know we give ourselves enough time for lag and things like that. Um, I can tell you that the critical path on how certain items will be completed has not been determined yet. Um, but as we do these projects, we make sure that you always have a pool available, for example. So you won't have to worry about that. Often, if we were renovating, let's say, gyms, we even move the gym to different rooms in the building. So um, I don't think you have to worry about that, but we'll be able to answer those questions more specifically as we move forward. Um, from a how it will impact you, again, that's a means and methods question about um, kind of where they'll be. For the most part, I will tell you that the structural components of the building that you'll see today, look at them, they're gonna have a jackhammer involved. <laughs> Okay, now if you're on this side of the building do, and the works on that side of the building, it'll only be during work hours, all right? And I don't know that you'll necessarily hear it with a lot of impact in your unit if they're on this side and you're on this side. So it probably will be, let's say like at Aquarius, for example, um, it'll probably be like a, depending on the means and methods, maybe a six month window during the day where you will actually be able to hear it. Um, that's a guesstimate. The other components, maybe the air conditioning, you might have the air conditioning down for a certain amount of time. It depends on if they wanna have an auxiliary unit when you do it. There's a lot of variables that go into that, so I don't wanna to commit to it, but it'll vary, but I can tell you it's not gonna kill anybody. I promise. Yes, ma'am. Would you please tell me, tell us, what is your relationship with Falcon? Uh, I don't have a relationship with Falcon. Huh? How you this I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Just to explain you, Falcon, in the two pager you have, we went through a selection process of five engineering firms. Okay? We had like about 30, 40 criteria of picking the firm based on experience, based on where they can lead us, uh, the knowledge, the team. We don't want an engineering firm with only one player or two players. We went through five person, multiple meetings. If you look on page two of the two pager, you see the dates and where and when we saw them. So we compare the price, we compare the expertise and the level of comfort we had with the people. And Falcon, William and Sinisa were the best we saw. And uh, in the quotes and the money we were providing were good. And that's, why we were, that's how we went with Falcon. So we, as the board, decided to bring Falcon then we integrated, we asked Sherry and Steven who said, listen, we need an expert from AP who's gonna help us because us as a board, first time we do this as well, okay? To fix a, a building, uh, I don't do this in my daily life, okay? So it's not my job, and it's not Jenna's job, and it's not Denise's job, okay? So an hospital, a psychologist, gardener, IT guy, IT guy, so we don't do, we don't do building, so we need expert. Okay, we cannot look at Google and find on Google how to fix a building. We cannot do that, we need an expert. So we, as a board, went through the selection process. So that's how Falcon has been choose, and they've been extremely good so far. Billy is an expert in monetization. So we asked Sherry and Steven, who's AP? Because we're paying AP fees, monthly fees, to help us. We said, you have somebody out there that knows how to do a monetization. 
that guy, who's like a linebacker from the Miami Dolphin, <laughs> basically has an expertise, and he did it like over 100 times. So we asked Billy and Sinisa to work together in order to help us make the decision. So that's how we've been there together. Okay, I hope this clarified uh, the process. Okay. One more question. Uh, make it two, because I saw two hands. I'll come to you next. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Ferdinando. I'm in Unit 320. I have this uh, question because of the first question that was asked. How do you make a contractor continue and perform? My question to you is, do you do use bid bonds? Do you use performance bonds? That's my question. Yeah, well, so each community makes a, makes a business decision, frankly, if you, you, if you do what's called a performance bond. Um, I always recommend it on larger jobs, anything over somewhere between a million and two million dollars, I always recommend a performance bond. The issue that some clients come up to, depending on where you rank in there, is performance bonds cost money. So the association would be responsible for paying the performance bond one way or the other, either through the contract or separately. And sometimes that can be 1% or 1.5% of the total price. Um, I don't think I've seen it more than that, but um, that's a decision the association will make. I would say for this particular j um, job, depending on the scope, um, it would probably be very wise to do so. But when you choose a larger company, they usually have adequate, in well, they always have adequate insurance also. So it's like a second set of insurance, and you have to make that business decision. Your board will make that decision. Uh, yes, ma'am. One last question. I'm going to come over here. I feel like I'm on, what is it, Jerry Springer? Um, how does this whole process, how is this going to be affected by the next board of elections, which is, which is only in April? What if there's new board people? Well, yeah, I, I, I can tell you, I often get that question. I, I would tell you that the board might change. This doesn't. All right? So, all right? Uh, all right. I mean, you can look, as you look at this today, you'll see that changing a person, a human being, doesn't change what you'll see today. All right. Um, I hope that they've done a miraculous job. I don't obviously know who's going to run, but they've done a miraculous job, honestly, from an organization perspective. Um, and to give you an idea of when you say an expert, I don't know what that means per se, but I can tell you that if you go just, just in Hollywood, um, the wave we did, we're in the middle of Aquarius. Now we have here, we have Parker Dorada, we did Hallmark, we're getting ready to start Lemire, and we have Hemispheres that's ongoing just in Hollywood Hallandale. And I probably have another $45 million worth of projects around the area. Um, board members typically are, uh, vi they have vision, they have goals, um, they're typically lay people, right? They, they, he told you their background, but their background actually facilitated a very strong process and a very logical way of being able to accumulate information. Um, that, from a fundamental perspective, when you look at associations, typically yields very good decisions because if you can accumulate the information appropriately, accurately, put it into some concise way, which Eric I don't know if you've ever seen his spreadsheets and everything else. They're very impressive. Very long. Oh, very long. It took me like literally 45 minutes to figure it out. Um, but it was very good. Um, they've done a nice job being able to accumulate the information, and that, that should give you comfort that the decisions would probably pre be pretty good. So um, moving on, the next um, portion, this is the fun part. I'm going to turn it over to Sinisa. Um, here, you can have this and that. Well, uh, I'm not sure about the fun part, but definitely a, an interesting part. So, uh, everything that uh, Billy said led to what we have completed so far. He, he explained the process and uh, he explained the roles of all the players uh, currently engaged. Uh, I want to tell you where we are today. Today, we have completed the evaluation, the assessment of the property. We are presenting our findings to you. 
upon which we will start uh, the preparation of the specifications that are going to be used for that contractor selection process. So for everybody's understanding, the specifications, the bidding process for selection of a contractor has not started yet. We just finished the evaluation. Right now, I'll be presenting the findings. This is the condition of your building. This is when you went to a doctor and he gave you a list of, this is what's wrong. The next step is going to be how we fix it. That's going to be the next step. So right now, what was our involvement? We are an engineering company and as such, we do boring engineering. Uh, not something that you want on Saturday morning for sure. But what did we do? First, we did a document review. We reviewed all the documents that were available at the time to get understanding of where this building is, what it went through, and to collect any information that may be pertinent to what our findings are and the future resolutions to, to the problems we observe. So we, res we reviewed previous reports, we uh, reviewed uh, past specifications, uh, anything that has to do with the history of the building. What was the assessment of the building? What it consisted of? We separated it into several uh, uh, phases. So the facade and the balconies is basically the exterior of the buildings, both buildings. The roofs, the parking garages, the pool decks and pools, sea walls, and then major electrical and mechanical plumbing components. As a result of that, we have produced four reports. Two structural reports, one mechanical report, and one electrical report. So the first part, and not in this order, because we did everything cumulatively, that we are going to be presenting is the uh, facade and the balcony survey, basically the assessment. Aside from the, the drawings and, and the review of the documents, we have performed a physical inspection of the property of the all exterior uh, areas that are accessible. We have, when we went to some of the balconies, approximately 16% of the balconies have been inspected. We did a drone investigation of the building. We had a drone flying around your building to check for any problems that we cannot see from the ground or from the balconies that might be important for us to address. We documented all the deficiencies and uh, I will show you some of them. This is what we were looking for, and uh, photos are gonna better describe than us uh, reading through all of this. So, this is a concrete spalling. For anybody that wants to know what it is, it's a piece of concrete detaching from the building and potentially falling off the building. This is a major life safety concern because those concrete pieces, when they fall down from heights uh, uh, that you have on your building, can cause a serious damage to the property, injuries, or even death. I was part of a building where we did a concrete restoration process. During construction, a piece of concrete fell down from the 40th floor, went right through the hood of the police car on the ground floor. Obviously, it has to be a police car. <laughs> so. You can see the rebar, you can see the cracking, you can see the pieces of concrete falling off, you can see the rebar. All of these are bigger, major problems from a life sta safety standpoint, from a structural stability of the building. They are problems because this condition can threaten the edges of the balconies, sometimes compromise the safety of the railings and cause bigger problems on the balconies. You can see all of this is just showing you throughout your buildings what are the types of the conditions. Obviously, you know about your decorative block, which is a major life safety concern. And this picture doesn't do it justice because what you can see here is just a little piece of, of uh, what seems to be a decorative block falling off. 
But if you actually go and check this from up close, you can see that the, what you cannot see here, that each of these uh, sections is held by steel anchors and steel angles at the bottom that are completely corroded. Slab edges that are co holding this in place are completely detaching from a building. This is a, a, a major, major problem. And this is something that is being addressed as we speak. This is something that is a major life safety and structural concern for us. I want to bring something else. This, uh, tiles on the balconies, uh, beautiful. However, if installed incorrectly, cause several problems. This one in particular is where the tile is higher than your slider. When the water falls in this track, it does not drain. Doesn't have anywhere to go, it can only go down or in. And then you have a water problem. It's a big problem. You can see the pieces of the concrete missing and falling. You can see the extensive cracking throughout your property. All of these are points for potential water intrusion. Plus, future delamination of stucco. Because this crack today can be a crack, tomorrow can be a huge piece of stucco missing like you have in some other areas. This is happening pretty much on every single balcony. You have these pieces of, of, of concrete or stucco on each balcony that are falling off. And on a lot of balconies actually fell off. Sometimes they fall in, inside the balcony, but sometimes they can fall outside of the balcony, which is obviously a bigger concern, as you can see. Uh, just a, a little clarification, so for, for everybody. There are, there are three components uh, to, to your exterior cladding. There is a structure, which is usually concrete and masonry. That's your structural system. Then you have stucco, which is a cementitious material that goes on the concrete. Stucco's purpose is to give it a static appearance and serve as a part of the waterproofing system of your, uh, of your building. It does not necessarily have a structural function at all. But if the stucco falls, it has a big uh, life safety impact. And then there is paint. Paint is the number one protection of your building when it comes to water uh, intrusion prevention. Okay? So paint and stucco work as a waterproofing protection. Mason and concrete work as a structure. If paint does this, that means that stucco is going to be affected, and after stucco, concrete is going to be affected. And we want to prevent stucco and concrete being affected because cheapest repairs are the repairs of the paint. Roof inspections. Roof inspections consisted of, again, in addition to document review, visual inspection of the roof, moisture, moisture survey, and core samples. So visual inspections is pretty self-explanatory. Moisture survey, what is a moisture survey? A testing lab was brought in with something they call a nuclear gauge, which basically sets a grid of points on the, on the roof and tests for the presence of moisture underneath the membrane. Something that we cannot see. But they test and try to find out, is there a moisture under your roof? And then to confirm those findings, we actually did a core sample, which means we had a company to come in and drill into your roof up to a structural slab, take a piece of that whole roof system out, and find out what the actual conditions are. Blue is wrong. It should be red because that you know, stands out more, but here it says elevated levels of moisture blue. You don't, I don't know if you see the numbers, but I think in your, in your uh, uh, printouts you have that. You can see that there is a lot of numbers that says, let's say 100. 
that implies 100% of moisture, which was later on confirmed through an actual core sample. Florida Building Code says that if you have more than 25% of the roof that needs repairs, the whole roof needs to be repaired. So, uh, and here is why. You can see the tears in the roof, you can see the flashings, you can see the, the problems that are happening on your roof. You can see the water ponding areas, you can see why is this roof in this condition. This is the other roof, tiny bit better, but still well over 25%. So, again, going back to what the problems are. You can see the cracking, alligatoring in the membrane. You can see all of that that is causing these roofs to be in the condition they are. Garage inspections. We performed a visual inspection. We performed checking uh, through a, a performator, which is a device that tests the presence of the rebar in the columns, in the slabs, and all of that. We performed multiple uh, uh, inspections, and based on that, uh, uh, observed various problems in the garage. You can see the excessive cracking with signs of water intrusion. This nice staining here is uh, what is, uh, you know, in caves called stalactites, when the water comes down and leaves the calcium deposits. And in caves, it's very nice and beautiful, and we all go to see it. However, in your garage, you absolutely don't want to have that, especially because there is your car underneath that, and nice stain, white stain that sets on your car. It cannot be washed away. So, plus, the rebar that is in this slab gets affected by this and then causes that spalling, then we need to repair and by the way, this is how one of the repair looks like. <clears throat> so you can see the, the cracking, you can see the peeling of the, of the waterproofing membranes on top of the garage, you can see the low uh, post pocket spots for the railings where the corrosion is taking place, plus this is a point of water intrusion, you can see the pieces of concrete falling off, you can see the rebar, uh, uh, being exposed, all of this is a big problem. You can see the cracking in the columns. Uh, cracking in the columns is a very uh, 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 big problem for us. Columns are your major structural support. They keep everything in place. For a point of reference, if there is a problem with a slab, like your horizontal surface, and piece of the slab fails, only that portion is affected. Yeah, I, I will explain that. If the column fails, everything that is above that column gets affected. So columns are critical parts of any structure. To that point, uh, there are uh, six columns in building 3000 uh, that we investigated have severe problems and we checked that presence of rebar and the findings were not uh, uh, very good. Well, they were not good at all. There seems to be a lack of rebar in those columns, which is why we recommended the board to uh, uh, proceed with emergency uh, 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 temporary shoring of those columns as a proactive measure. Uh, I usually get a question, well, Sinisha, that, that's all nice, and you're telling me all of these horror stories, but this means it's been like this, you know, and been standing, and we didn't have any problems, and yes, we see a crack here and there. Uh, you don't want to experiment. You really don't. This is not something you want to experiment with. Just because it's been standing here for a year, two years, or five months, I don't know, whatever it is, you don't want to wait to see this fail, so for me to tell you, I told you so. So this is something that you take, have to take really seriously. It's another thing. Your parapets and your railings in multiple locations are lower than 42 inches. Florida Building Code says that railings and any 
uh, a guardrail that is preventing a fall larger than, than uh, 30 inches needs to have a 42 inch railing. It's 40. And I know the, when we think about it, how big of a difference two inch does really make? Well, sure. it's exactly the point. These two inches make all the difference in the world when there is a lawsuit. Whether they actually make a difference in real life, it's irrelevant. Because this is a couple of million dollar difference. Pool deck inspections. So we performed visual inspection and we observed the deficiencies of the pool deck. You can see the displacement of the pavers. You can see the problems with cracking. You can see the dislodging and, and areas where the pavers are moving and uh, setting apart. You can see the corroded junction boxes with presence of water inside. You can see the problems in your uh, uh, rooms and mechanical rooms. You can see the cracking along the pool sides. Uh, 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 the ponding water sections, the obvious water intrusion problems, again, concrete restoration. And by the way, pool deck and garage are interconnected because the failure of waterproofing on top of the garage causes problem in the garage. So we have two problems. We need to keep the water out and then fix the concrete because fixing the concrete in the garage without doing anything on top doesn't solve a problem. It gives you a band-aid, but doesn't solve a problem. Again, those nice stalactites, you can see the, the, the column uh, spalling and reinforcement. By the way, this is most likely around 15 to 20% of that column cross-section gone. That means the capacity of the column has been reduced. Seawall inspections. Out of everything that we inspected, seawalls are in the best condition, which is good. No, no, this is good. Let me, let me tell you, this is good because seawalls are the most expensive to repair. So seawalls uh, exhibit some problems, but those are problems that we would, I would qualify them as wear and tear. Something that you would expect to see on a seawall of a certain age or a certain performance. So. Uh, uh, you will see that there are some problems, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's not something, you know, there, there is some corrosion, there is some problems, but again, comparing to what you've seen on the facade, in the garage, and all of those areas, you can see that the level, the magnitude of this is really not uh, 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 that, that big. Uh, don't be misguided by this, these are barnacles, so they don't look pretty anyways. Uh, so we had a, a person in the water, we had a diver that did inspection from the water, under the water line of the, of the seawalls. There were really no uh, 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 big damages. There are some cracks, and uh, these cracks are something that, that can be uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, easily repaired. But the, the idea is that the seawall doesn't, any of the seawalls, you have two, one on the 3,000 side, one on the 3,001 side. The one on 3,000 side is a true seawall because it's in the water. One on 3,001 is more of a retaining wall plus seawall because it's only in the uh, uh, time of the surge in the, in the high tides when it actually starts working as a, as a seawall. But in both of those, it's uh, 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 there in, let's call it fair condition with need of some repair. Um, HVAC. Uh, unfortunately, I have absolutely zero good news about this. Uh, and I'll give you uh, something. Aside from uh, what we performed in uh, visual inspections and, in, 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 you know, we communicated very closely with your management team that, and your engineering team that has to deal with this equipment. Uh, what is the difference between the structure and, uh, and the equipment. Well, the structure is concrete. You know, it's a concrete, this uh, 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 waterproofing. It's something that you put on and you paint it and, and fix it every now and then, but it's static. It does not move. Your equipment is something that has a dynamic function. It constantly works, or it should work. So, uh, 
the level, the approach is different. We rely a lot on the information that we can get from people that are dealing with this on a daily basis. How many times did it break? How, many, how much money do you spend fixing it? What are the problems that you have in you fixing it? Is it fixable at all? Are there parts available? How long does it take before you can get it fixed? Because all of you know instantaneously when the AC goes down. Everybody knows, like immediately. Even three seconds before that, Steven gets a phone call and say, hey, why is AC not working? It's working right now. That's good. That's good. The point is, when there is a problem on a concrete, you may or may not notice it. But when there's a problem with the equipment, you notice it immediately. So the, the evaluation of this equipment doesn't go only from a standpoint of, well, can it last another year? but also has to do with a position of how fast can we maintain it and how much money are we spending in maintenance and rep repairs of this equipment on a daily basis. And uh, you will see that uh, your equipment is taking quite a beating. And this is just from the how it looks. How it doesn't perform, you cannot see on the photos. But it doesn't. In the report, you will see, uh, when, when you know, Monday becomes available, you will see w or, or read what it doesn't work. Again, I cannot show it here uh, you know, with a thumbs down saying it doesn't work. This is just to show you how it looks. And, and you can see the, the, the condition of, of some of this uh, uh, equipment. The, the advanced stages of the piping, the, the corrosion, and, and uh, basically the inability of your management team and your maintenance and engineering team to keep this running. <laughs> so, uh, again, you can, all of this, uh, I mean, this, is, uh, this should be like, a, you know, one of those mute films. I don't do anything, I just, Yes. It's not fun what you see, but this one has a little name. Little House on the Prairies. Little House on the Prairies. Michael London, something like that. So, uh, our recommendations uh, uh, for, for all the mechanical equipment. Yes. Electrical assessment. Uh, on, uh, on the other hand, electrical equipment, uh, for the most part, is in maintainable condition. It does show some deficiencies, but we would list those under not necessarily uh, failures, rather than it needs work on, it can be worked on. Uh, the major problems were not observed. There are problems with panel boards, there are problems with some conduits, there are problems with some wiring, but on the grand scheme of things, we would not list those as a, 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 a catastrophe. Uh, so as you can see, inaccurate circuit panel directory identification labels, uh, some of the panels are at the end of their uh, life and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, no existing service contract for emergency uh, generator. This is something that needs to be addressed because your generator needs to be uh, constantly tested and, and serviced. Uh, this first thing, it's a, it's a huge life safety issue. Inaccurate panel directory is such an easy thing. When you open your panel on the, on the doors, you have, this is for the, I don't know, I'm going to use the resident uh, panel. This is for the dishwasher, this is for the boiler, this is for the, I don't know, fridge and whatnot. But if they are inaccurate and you want to fix your fridge uh, or whatever, uh, well, not fridge, but something that's hardwired, uh, potentially a, 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 a dishwasher or something like that, or a microwave, uh, you turn off what says a microwave, uh, but that you actually turned off the lights in the bedroom, and then you go work on a microwave and get electrocuted. So it's, it's, it's very, very uh, important. So these are the damages. As, we said, as I said about the panel boards, you can see the corrosion, you can see the debris, you can see the 
uh, problems in, inside the panel boards. Uh, the problem with electrical is, uh, aside from the uh, problems with the service, the problem with electrical is uh, life safety from a fire hazard standpoint. Electrical has a tendency when it fails to cause fire, to cause fire. So that's why this is something that definitely uh, 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 needs to be uh, 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 considered. So at the end, we have presented all of this in our report in much greater detail. Uh, the report had defects, examples, and then analysis and recommendations. So all of these items uh, are described plus recommendations for all of this. The recommendation is uh, are basically going to be what we are going to put in specifications. So, in, 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 in short, in our opinion, roof on both buildings needs to be replaced in full. The exterior of the building, you need to repair all the concrete efficiencies, stucco deficiencies, caulking, and all of that, and then you need to paint the buildings. On the garage, you need to repair all the concrete efficiencies, but before that, we need to deal with water intrusion issues, which means we will need to re-waterproof 3,000 building deck to reset the pavers, uh, resurface the pool, change some of the railings, and then go into the concrete uh, uh, problems inside the garage. On a 3,001 building, we'll need to deal with the waterproofing on top of the garage, then uh, some asphalt issues on the bottom of the garage, uh, and deal with some minor uh, 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 paver repairs because the difference between these two pull decks is very simple. This is on grade, which means it's on soil. That one is on concrete. So the same doesn't apply for both, for both decks. Uh, when it comes to mechanical, there's going to be a lot of replacements. A lot of replacements of mechanical equipment. Pretty much... Uh, good portion, I don't want to, you know, bid on the percentages, but high percentage of your equipment is going to be, have to be replaced. On the electrical, there are going to be some replacement, but there's going to be some of the maintenance, so less of an impact. On the seawalls, uh, again, as once we start doing the, the exteriors and all of that, uh, we'll retain, uh, uh, your board will retain the services of a contractor who can do these uh, spot repairs on the seawalls. And, and give it a uh, 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 you know, proactive approach to preserve the life of the seawall for the, for the years to come. So next step, repair specifications. We uh, 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 will be working on that. It's going to be a very comprehensive plan for the roofs, for the facade, for the garages, for the HVAC, for the electrical, for all of that. Once we have that ready, bidding process, construction administration, and so on, as Billy has explained uh, before, again, that's, that's what we're going to be. Uh, quickly, the bidding, uh, at least five contractors, we are still debating, Billy, uh, uh, the AMP uh, wants this to be an open bid with a bid bond to answer some of the questions. We are specs, uh, 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 but this is something that's going to be negotiated uh, with the board always require payment and performance bond. Liquidating damages is something that is going to be part of this. Uh, we will work closely with your attorneys to have prepare a template of a contract to be sent along with, uh, with the bidding specs to everybody so they understand the legal aspect. For everybody's understanding, the specifications have three parts. Part number one is technical. That's the boring part, but crucial part. How do you repair this? drawings, details, materials, specifications. That's the technical part. Then there is an administration part, which says, this is where you're going to park, this is where you're going to use the restroom, this is how you come to the property, this is how you leave from the property, all of those things. Trust me, those things can be a major hindrance to the project. And then the third part is the legal part. All the segments in there that are important for uh, a legal aspect. And, and uh, what I like to say about this particular part is contract is a key to your successful project simply because, and I'm sure some of you are uh, uh, 
unfortunately familiar with this, contracts are written not for the marriage, but for the divorce. So when everything is going nice and dandy, nobody cares about the contract. As soon as there is a problem, oh, let me check the paragraph seven, you know, subparagraph E says this. That's what we want to do. We want to protect ourselves, you as the association, that we put as much information as possible, as much protection as possible for you, for your board, that the project runs under your terms, not the terms of the contractor. Construction administration is something that comes at the, uh, when the project actually starts, and that's going to be including a, what Billy already explained. I don't want to go uh, in, much, in much detail. There are going to be meetings, as he explained, weekly meetings, a constant on-site supervision, a review of the documents, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, well, thank you for staying awake for this uh, part. So uh, if anybody has any, any questions, uh, yeah, I'll... My name is Rena DeFeria, and I own Unit 913 and 1219 at the moment, too. My question, I guess maybe more to the board and maybe you as well, has any thought been given when we start doing the concrete work of getting rid of the side panels of concrete on the balconies, which are really not very pretty? I don't know how expensive that would be. I don't know whether that would make sense. But other buildings have all glass all around. And I think it's very nice, at least if we could get something that looks better as well as the expense of just maintaining, I think that would be great. But of course, it all depends on cost. Make sure everybody heard the question. No? So the question is, you have those concrete side panels on your balconies. The question was, was any thought given to removal of those side panel, concrete panels and replacing it with railings? You know, we can certainly add that as an add alternate to what other construction documents are, and then we can give it a price, and that, again, that's something that's going to be considered, and every unit owner will have, you know, to decide whether that's something that we want to do or not. But it will, it could, it could be an ad alternate to the construction documents, okay, when we do those. Uh, is Falcon or anybody else going to follow up on the work that contractors are doing, especially on the concrete stuff, because, you know, I don't want people just to paint over stuff and then, I know contracts, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question is, is there going to be an engineering supervision uh, of the work once the work actually starts? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, it's required by the, by the uh, city, by the building department. They require that there is an inspector on site that, that is going to be controlling the work. And on top of that, uh, Falcon will be um, uh, controlling the work. So uh, we are the ones that designate what gets done on the building, not the contractor. Contractor just does the work. We say, you chip here, you repair there, you replace the river here. We mark it. There is a extensive field documentation. And then contractor comes and does the work. We control the work. There is no such a thing as contractor starts chipping on the left side of the building and ends up on the right and says there is a change order for a million dollars. That doesn't exist that way. We say you chip from here to here. If there is need to extend the chipping, then we go into discussion why, where, and how. We confirm that and then move, move forward. So yes, there's going to be an extensive uh, oversight of the contractor once the project actually starts. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I have two people before you, but I'll come to you. Hi, I'm Sally West. I'm in 1608 across the street. From your preliminary assessment, and you had several categories, I'm wondering overall, is one building in significantly worse condition than the other when you consider all the categories? And really where I'm heading with that question is, I'm assuming we're going to have a significant assessment or HOA fee increase. And being from upstate New York, where we always subsidize all those people down in New York City, <laughs> I'm wondering if we're going to have a similar situation where, through no one's fault, but one building, I know this building is larger, uh, requires significantly more repair or fee than the other. So what's, what's the overall assessment of the, of the two buildings? Everybody heard a question? Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry? 
ask even one question real quick. <laughs> Sorry, guys, hold on. Do you have a tiered budget or do you have a straight budget where they're all in one percentage of ownership? Uh, straight percentage of ownership. Okay, cool. All right, just needed to make sure it wasn't a, a tiered budget. Okay, <clears throat> both, if you look in your governing documents, it has a list of the units and it's called a percentage of ownership. What that does is it takes the total square footage of every unit in both buildings, sums them to a total, and then it takes your number of square feet in your unit and divides it by the total. That is the percentage that you own of the corporation known as the residences. That's also how your fee structure will be calculated. So if one building's worse than the other, everybody pays. That's something he would have to answer. But I, I mean, the reality is, I'm going to say this in general, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming they're both in relatively the same status, building-wise. So when you look at the pools, which I think he explained, the pools are very different. So one pool is on the ground, and one's over a garage. So that pool, based on the size of it, is going to be more expensive to fix than, say, if this one had a problem, then this one would. This one's much easier. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to give it back. I'm yeah. controlling. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a controlling yeah, there is a gentleman. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Gentleman, gentleman, you, so I'll. I just wanted to know, how, as an engineer, uh, what kind of time frame are you looking at to complete a job like this? So, the question is, uh, how, what is the time frame to complete the project like this? So, uh, Bill is going to go into more detail about that, I think, later on, correct? So he's going to give you some time frames as to what to expect. Uh, 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 but the, the thing is this. Uh, we are in the process, as I said, uh, or, or, or putting the specs together, which is going to have multiple phases of this project. This cannot be done all at the same time. So we, we will, working with your board, working with, with AMP, come up with a sequencing how to do this project. So not every single part of the building is going to be affected simultaneously. Uh, before we start the project, there are going to be many months before we get to that point. Because the whole process of specifications, bidding, selection of the contract, or negotiations, I, I'm going to say that you won't see anybody working here in an ideal world. Let's assume that we are going to do that probably six to eight months from today. From the time we start, I, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very difficult to say. Uh, it, it is very difficult to say, but uh, don't expect this to be a one-year project. That's not going to be a one-year project for sure. No. I just had a question. Um, these electrical panels, are those just within outside of our apartments or those include our apartments also like we have panels in our apartments okay now is that repair going to be in that or is that something we're responsible for and number two i guess from uh, we don't have to restructure all the balconies they're going to be repaired um, within that repair will we have like plywood on our windows like if you live here for six months you know that might be an issue Two questions. Question number one, are the panels that we are discussing here inside the units or not? The panels that we are discussing are outside the units. Those are panels for the building, for the common element. Uh, obviously, if you have panels inside your unit that look like that, you want to do something about it. Don't, don't wait. So that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, are we going to deconstruct the balconies and build them again, or they're going to be in a repairable condition? And are we going to have plywood on the doors? Are we going to have what is, a, I assume, level of inconvenience for the unit owners when the, actually, the project actually starts? So our assessment of your balcony says that there may be a couple of balconies that have a little bit of a bigger work on them. We don't foresee at this point a deconstruction of any balconies. There is going to be some work. There are going to be some balconies that are going to be more worked on than the others. Uh, is there going to be an inconvenience? Yes. Regardless whether we deconstruct your balcony or not, you will not be able to go outside on the balcony. 
they are going to be locked from the outside. It's a life safety issue because once we start working on the balcony, even if we paint the balconies, you cannot go outside because it's a construction zone. The contractor is not obligated to clean every single day the balcony, remove all the, uh, the big debris and all of that. They have to, but a little you know, broom sweep is not required. Somebody can go out, slip, and then cause a problem. Another thing is it's a huge liability for the contractor. If you've ever seen a swing stage on the building, it has those steel lines and safety ropes that are going in front of your balcony. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. They were renters inside the units that were unhappy that there is work going on while they are renting a unit, a short-term rental for three or four weeks, and it's obstructing their view and it's causing them a lot of problems. They went out and nicked the cables. They didn't cut them. They nicked them just enough. So if the swing stage started going up, it can fail. The criminal charges were, 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 were uh, brought against that particular individual. So things like this happen, uh, and that's why you will not have access to the balcony. If there is a concrete work on your balcony, there is going to be a plywood on your door to protect your glass. But that's going to last only while we are chipping. Once the chipping is done, the contractor will remove the, the plywood. Again, you, you may have, you, know, you will have inconvenience because you won't be able to use the balcony, is there going to be obstruction from, I don't have any light coming into my unit and all of that? It may be for a short period of time. Uh, don't ask me what is short, because, uh, 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 you know, again, depending on how big the problem in your balcony is. So, uh, will, uh, as, as you can, as you heard from, from Bill's and, and Board's uh, 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 presentations, We'll have a couple of these meetings as we go along. And as we come closer to the construction, I'm sure there's going to be a meeting in which the board will ask me to show you some photos of the actual construction and how it looks and what are all the problems that we may have and what are all the conditions to prepare you for, for something that definitely is an inconvenience, but it's something that has to be done. Okay? This is not a, something that is a, a unfortunately a negotiable item. Uh, there was a, I'm sorry, there was a man there, and yes. Thank you. I'm owner of 937 and 1123, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lopez. I have two questions. Number one, you mentioned that projects are going to be done uh, individually, not all at once, correct? My, in phases, thank you. My question is the assessment. Is it going to be for the total project, or is it going to be face by face? That's my one question. Very important. <laughs> my second question, um, in your inspections, did you find mold? So, uh, question number one, is the assessment going to be phased along with the project? And question number two, is there, is, did we find mold? I'll answer the question number two, because question number one is not an engineering question. Uh, uh, no, we did not find any mold. Uh, first of all, we are not qualified mold assessors, and as such, even if I would find something that resembles like a mold, I don't. My insurance and liability prevents me from stating it's mold because I'm not certified to do that. But to, to that extent, our inspection of the units when we went in was focused primarily on the outside of the unit and checking for the concrete damages and defects. Obviously, if we were in the unit and somebody showed us a major crack inside of something, we would document it, but uh, we did not, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell. We didn't check for that per se. Yes. Um, without being too committal, considering, frankly, we haven't had any significant conversations about how the special assessment would be structured, um, We've done it many, many ways. I can assure you that once we understand the full scope of the financial commitment the association um, needs to undertake, there will be different options presented to the board of directors and the association to consider. More than likely, um, the how we do it most often, is the loan that is actually facilitated for the association is based on a draw schedule. So it has a line of credit period for usually 24 months. 
Um, and then it has a term loan, it terms after those 24 months. So if you think of that financial instrument, there's multiple ways that the association can adhere to its financial responsibility given that structure. Um, one is to do the special assessment consistent with the loan terms, which is a line of credit, which is a very small amount for two years, and then it balloons after the two years when you really know how much it costs. And the other one is to take the full amount of the projected total of the work and start that assessment day one for the term of the loan and then do a true up two years later once you know what the real expenses are. I don't want to talk arbitrarily, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but that kind of gives you a peripheral of you know, the dynamic of how that works. And when we have real numbers, we'll be able to talk about it a little bit more thoroughly. Um, Jeannie and Michael, we live in 1206. My question um, was the mold, good job. And the second question that I had is, it, will there be a priority as far as things that are like dramatically dangerous, like the columns that you mentioned in the parking lot in 3000 or, you know, things falling from the balconies rather than, you know, looking at something else first. And I just wondered about the priorities. Thanks. So uh, the question is, what is the priority? And that is uh, both an excellent question and a difficult question because uh, priorities are, and in our opinion, from a life safety perspective, we already took steps to uh, uh, remediate some of those absolute priorities such as the decorative walls, such as those columns in the garage. They're not being repaired. They're being supported for the time being, which means we are uh, adding structural support to your garage. Uh, I also think that the management and engineering went into the units and removed from those uh, con concrete walls, removed all of the pieces that were loose to prevent any of them potentially falling down. So we already took the steps to temporarily fix some of these things just as again better safe than, than sorry. Now when it comes to the actual phasing of the project, there are multiple, multiple things that have to be considered. As you, as you understood, there is going to be a mechanical component, there is going to be a structural component, there is going to be a roof component. A lot of your mechanical equipment is on the roof. So there is going to be a very uh, a, a, a lengthy discussion here, what goes first? Because it's not just about, uh, uh, you know, we can solve some of this problem with these temporary patches for the time being, but then you don't want to you know, do we put the roof first and then go and trample the roof with the new mechanical equipment? Do we put the new mechanical equipment, but then there is potential of roof leaking? All of those questions are something that we'll have to have a separate discussion and, and answer uh, uh, what takes first. Obviously, everything that is a life safety component takes precedence. But again, we're trying to solve this in a matter of temporarily fixing the things so we prevent that life safety concern. And then uh, from a logistic standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from a level of inconvenience standpoint, address all of this. Because ideally, if you can do the deck and the building and the garage at the same time, it would be ideal. The, le the least amount of inconvenience for everybody, but then you don't have anywhere to park, you don't have a pool, and you have no balconies. And then there is a riot and there is people with guns here shooting at me. So, you know, I, I, like, I like to stay alive. That's, you know, my goal after these projects. So as such, we need to take that in consideration. So all of that is something that is still, uh, our specifications are going to say what needs to be done. And then there's going to be a special segment of that as to when it's going to be done. Because, again, it has to incorporate several, several aspects. Yes, ma'am. One was on, uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the deterioration is caused not only by the age of certain things, but also by the exposure to the elements. So I wanted to know, because obviously we are in extreme weather elements here, both from sun, rain, wind, hurricane, ocean, intracoastal, what uh, would be done to try to increase the longevity of the restoration especially regarding the environmental elements that these buildings have to withstand. And then my other 
I heard the glass with the balcony and I immediately thought of the pool deck over on the 3000 building, which sounds like it's really going to have significant amount of work, including maybe that uh, construction of that wall if it's two inches short. So how about glass so we actually get to see the intracoastal and all the beauty, beauty of that? So to answer question number two first, because I see it's a, a, a very important question, your board already thought of that. So they, they, they are putting that in the, in the bids. Uh, the idea is to provide something that is going to be uh, transparent uh, uh, and to allow people a better enjoyment of that pool deck. So we are thinking in that, in that aspect as well. So, uh, uh, and not just that, a anywhere where we see that there is a, a chance, if you're gonna do major restoration, there is a chance to improve the, the aesthetics and uh, uh, the performance of the, of the building and enjoyment, we'll definitely propose that, and we have these discussions with the board or with the management all the time. The, the only problem always is, and Billy mentioned that, is the vote. So a lot of these things are considered architectural modifications and go through a certain process before they can be implemented. Uh, so rightfully so, as Billy said, so you don't paint the building pink because there you have a board member that loves pink. So uh, th that's, that's the, the, the point. The question number two is, oh, uh, technical, technical question number one was, what, is, uh, uh, what are we doing to protect the building in the future? So. Uh, the, the, the number one thing we will be doing is definitely specifying the materials for the repairs that are going to be uh, uh, better suited for the environment. As you can imagine, when you paint the building, uh, you don't have one paint. There are, you know, if you go to Home Depot, there is 17 different types of paints. Uh, well, we technically don't use Home Depot paint just for uh, uh, illustration. Uh, but even with the brand uh, names uh, in the industry for commercial and residential high-rise condominiums, there are different uh, uh, types of paint. So we will specify something that is better suited for the exposure to the, to the element. Same goes for the waterproofers. When you put a waterproofing material on your balcony, your deck, on your garage, is something that can last five years, or well, last, have a warranty of five years, or something has a warranty of 20 years. Uh, obviously, we are always prone to go with a better material simply because we believe in the long run they give a better uh, uh, cost ratio. Uh, simply, you know, you may have to pay an incrementally larger cost at the beginning, but throughout the years you have less of work. So long term you are saving, especially for the decks that have pavers and tiles and on top of that. Uh, you, the waterproofing goes underneath it. So the cost of doing that work is not just in the waterproofing membranes, it's also ripping out all the pavers and putting something underneath. So all of those things are taken in consideration. We will work with the management in establishing a maintenance plan. When, it, when we speak about mechanical equipment, uh, again, you can buy a off-the-shelf mechanical equipment, but then uh, what we recommend is when you buy equipment and we specify the equipment, there are certain coatings and procedures that can be done to in, uh, uh, recoat the certain exposed parts of the equipment of the uh, 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 all the mechanical parts, so they are uh, more protected from the environment. Uh, uh, the, the thing is this: uh, why is Florida such a great environment for engineers? Because of the weather. There is, you know, we, we can only do so much, but that sun, that salt does their work, and that, that's a repeat business for us. Uh, uh, the, the thing is, we do everything possible to put whatever protection is available to extend the life of the equipment. Uh, but we do that as an, throughout a system of options, because ultimately, you know, uh, everything costs money. So uh, there has to be a discussion as, do we want to do this every three years, every five years, or every 25 years? And then how much is that going to cost us? My name is uh, Yamini Farouk. I am living in 1609. For those that they are in our building for a year or two, I have this unit 16 years. This unit is, this building is 50 years old. It was converted. It is not brand new building. 
everything is shifted we are on a beach for those people that they bought half a price that we paid you be very happy you paid less we paid double your price for this unit and it is big problem for all of us so we are in a ship we have to follow up priorities is important we have to work it out however in my opinion the building at this stage has to be done ASHP the board members are only one year they did for all 15 years before nobody show us these problems and they touch here they touch there that was not done they everything that here is sufficient in my opinion I am not engineer I know my experience for the money that we might pay in future Beach Club is 15 years old 20 million dollars you can build a building so if you have assessment don't be surprised have a good day thank you uh, I'm sorry there was a gentleman and then you <laughs> Just a, oh sorry curiosity uh, what's the basis for your billing and fee uh, for both uh, Falcon and uh, the, 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 the basis of fee for the, the basis for engineering work and the, 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 the management and supervision? So uh, I cannot answer for management and their fee structure. <laughs> okay, for the fees of Billy, we pay AP uh, monthly fee for their services. It's included. It's been forever. It's been forever. It's, been forever. it's the first time it's been used. So there's no extra charge. But yeah, yeah, we never knew. I'm telling you now. This guy, sorry, Billy, is free. <laughs> well, no, it's not. No, it's not free, but it's part of our fees. So, so Stephen, Stephen is part of the payroll, but Sherry and Billy is part of the fees we're paying in a monthly basis on the budget. For Sinisa and Falcon, that's for sure. We had to make an agreement with them. They're not free, and and they're they're working with us. So we, yes, we have fees for them. Okay, so uh, we're not in the six figures at this stage. Uh, when we're going to do the project, we'll present all the numbers, but right now everything is reusable in fees. Okay, so uh, for all the works they did, pretty happy to, for the current fees we have. Uh, okay, so I hope it's clarified. Hi, my name is Joe, Unit 320. I have two questions. First question is, do you know the condition of the domestic cotton cold water distribution system to the apartments, the piping? Have you evaluated that? I don't see it on your report. Are you going to? Oh, okay, and then also along with that is the cooling, the chilled water piping, the condition of that. Okay, does anyone know the condition of them? Okay. That's fine. So the question was about the evaluation of the, uh, the, the risers in the, in the building. The management has a, a, a record of that. The risers are good, in good condition. They're copper, uh, so there is no, uh, no problems with that. And we did not perform the evaluation of the, uh, uh, the hot domestic. Yeah. yeah, no, we did not. Second question is, does the city of Hollywood have any tax abatements for buildings when you do a capital improvement? No, uh, no. The only thing for, let's say, Aquarius or the Wave that um, the city of Hollywood had when we did those was for aesthetic approvals, uh, aesthetic enhancements along A1A. In other words, if you revitalize the front of your building, they actually had a grant that the Wave got. The Wave got $50,000 to redo theirs, and there's a chance we'll submit for it uh, at Aquarius. But they don't have, 
um, tax credits through Hollywood or anything like that based on the equipment that you may install. Um, the FPNL used to for the roof. I don't think they have any longer. Um, there's a chance with some of the equipment, but I'll have to look at the specs that are actually provided. Uh, Alex shows the 1027 unit. I'm just going to ask you again, you know, I know you didn't do mold survey, but uh, what about moisture sur survey of the walls, exterior, and also window issue? Did anybody consider replacement, resealing? So, uh, so this is the thing. Uh, the, the moisture from the exterior is not commonly done because it's going to give us false results. Those walls are old paint. Uh, uh, old stucco, so at this point, I mean, not such a thing as an old stucco, but stucco has been exposed to an element through a paint, so those readings would not be viable. Uh, so no, we did not perform any moisture testing on the outside. However, uh, we did evaluate the condition of the caulking, we did evaluate the condition of the, of the windows, and there is an ongoing discussion with the, with the board about what is the best approach regarding the, the actual windows, and we had those discussions. Uh, uh, the part of our the part of our scope is definitely going to be resealing all of the stucco to metal connections, uh, basically where your window meets the the, raw, uh, the rough opening of the of the exterior. So where the masonry meets the the, the window, that's going to be resealed, or it's going to be part of our of our work. Uh, the everything beyond that, in terms of any uh, replacements of the windows, that's a discussion to be to be had. Now, I just want to uh, try to answer the question about a mold from a different perspective. Uh, whether you have mold or not right now is a function of how well is your building protected from the outside. Because uh, the mold on the inside can come from several factors, uh, condensation from your pipes, water intrusion in your, in your unit, unsealed penetration on the exterior that allow uh, hot, uh, moist air going into your wall cavities and all of that. So uh, the idea is that at least when we are done with this project, the exterior facade and the roof project, that all of those exterior points of moisture intrusion or hot air intrusion will be sealed and you will not have that going forward. That's the, that's the goal. So the goal is after we are done, no more cracks, no more unsealed penetrations, no more problems with, uh, 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 with paint and, and any of that. So if after this project you suspect that you have something on the inside the unit, at least from the outside we should eliminate all the sources, which means you should be okay to either hire a, a, an, air, you know, an air MD that come and test your wall cavities and air and for, for mold, uh, uh, and then they can tell you whether you have problems or not. Well, again, the leakage through the windows can come through, through two points. One point is the actual connection, the stucco to metal, which we will reseal. So we will eliminate that one. However, if your window, the, the window assembly has voids, has gasket problems, has frame problems where metal to metal, where jams meet, uh, if that's the problem and that's allow moisture to come in, that is something that we will not be able to address because that's the window assembly. The only way to solve the window assembly problem is to actually replace the window, change the window. I mean, you can do a band-aid repairs on the outside. You can try to caulk some gasket. You can try to fill some gaps and all of that. But in reality, all of that is a short-term solution if your window is already on that path of, of, of problems. So you can, you can do that. Uh, I'm not sure who is the owner of the windows in the building. Is that the, the, owner. yeah, the owners? The owners are responsible for the windows. Um, at Aquarius, actually, what we did, which I'll speak to the board with as we get a little farther in the project, is uh, Broward County does have a program called Go Green, um, which facilitates financing options through your taxes um, to be able to fund replacing the windows. And Aquarius has already gone through and has all the vendors lined up and everything else, so it should be pretty easy to take some of that work and kind of bring it over here. And while we did the, um, it's ongoing actually, as you could tell, 
Um, as they did the exterior concrete restoration at Aquarius, they had quite a few unit owners who were replacing the windows right before. So that's an option for everybody. Um, I'm going to say, is it okay if we say three more questions? We have a lot. We have a lot more. Stuff. So, my name is Esfera Weinstein, Unit fourteen forty five. Um, recently, redecking in the three thousand building was done. Now it's going to be redone again. Yeah, they took the decks off and they put uh, those uh, uh, parts on. Elevators were just repaired. Everybody is changing, but you guys are the same people. And we've been, we've been paying condo fees, and we had those people who were repairing stuff, and building in such a dire state, it wasn't done for 15 years at all. Well, well so you... you Right, you, ha you have to understand that the association is come on. the association is represented by the board for which the owners elect. There are differing opinions as how to address problems, for example, even in your own home. Um, you know, there are, as equipment ages, you have the ability to repair it, like your vehicle, right? And once you've had, once your vehicle gets up to 100,000 miles, between 100,000 miles and 150,000 miles, some people are willing to make that investment to replace things like brakes and shocks and struts or other material mechanical problems that might happen. As you get to 150,000 miles plus, that fiscal investment in that vehicle starts to pile up. And eventually, you're doing things with bubble gum and Band-Aids because they no longer make those parts or the mechanic is no longer alive because in this age with technological advances, the equipment ages very quickly. So from a condominium perspective, as the uh, components in the building age, decisions were made to essentially patch it rather than replace it. Um, and that was the decision that was made with a lot of the equipment. Now. I would also say certain decisions have to be good decisions also. So, for example, with certain pieces of equipment that you replace, it, it, cheapest is not always better. As a matter of fact, in this industry, when you look at mechanical equipment, often cheaper is worse, way worse. Um, for example, light bulbs. You can get LED light bulbs that are very inexpensive for the entire building, but it's not Sylvania, and five years later, those light bulbs no longer exist, and the and the color's different, right? So those are things that you have to look at today, and it's a little more complicated than just which is the lowest bid or how did these contractors or manufacturers actually get on the list in the first place. So pursuant to my last question, uh, you mentioned, uh, William, that uh, grants might be available if the outside facade has been improved. So I just wanted to make a point when you're making um, the bid for, for outside repairs, maybe you'd want to check to see also whether we could get some kind of rebate from the city of Hollywood. We'll make the call, but I'd like to be clear, it was for windows. So it, it's, not for, it's not for concrete restoration, which is the job. It's, it's, for, it's predominantly to increase energy efficiency within your structure. Oh, oh, you mean the front. Oh, yeah. It's actually right on A1A. So the grant that the WAVE got, for example, is for the aesthetic, the aesthetic enhancement they did on A1A. But once we improve the balconies, it would look a whole lot better. So that is the yeah, we, it's all about hiring the right landscape architect with the city. They know which components of the common areas that the city wants to see. My outside observation of watching the wave go through the process was it's predominantly the dry so what you see from your car right on the street but obviously we'll have the conversations we're not going to like limit your ability for grants if uh, they're there one more question anybody else uh, okay we'll move on where's the clicker all right fantastic now i'm going to have to apologize okay oh i apologize you did have your hand up yes Okay, uh, my question is, we have a, uh, my name is Ida Weizmann, Unit 500. Um, we have a situation, 
how come it was now never been controlled the buildings that they came to this um, point that we have to change everything are we going to control after we will do this it's a lot of money and where is this money if the board did not do anything where is the money gone and previous board that's what i mean of course how and where is the money and why wouldn't Right, so I hear this frequently. I hear this frequently. For example, let's say Aquarius, okay? I don't want to use this association specific because I don't want it to be personal to anyone that may be here, but I'll give you an overview of Aquarius and how they ended up where they are. Um, the Aquarius um, never funded reserves, all right? So when you don't fund reserves, that's like having to replace a roof on your house, right, and not putting money in the savings, right? Eventually, the roof needs to be replaced. You can't patch it anymore, and you either have the money or you don't have the money. If you don't have the money, you go get a loan, all right? It's very similar in a condo. In a condo, if you don't have reserves, when you have to do this work, well, you get a special assessment, right? And if it wasn't for borrowing money from a bank, the special assessment would be pay me all of it now, right? So it's very similar. You get a loan, okay? Um, I will tell you how buildings like this get to where you are, and I will tell you it's nowhere near what the Aquarius was. Okay, just an FYI, all right? Um, it's because, quite frankly, people are afraid of you, okay? Or they're afraid of the dollar amount. Or they don't believe it. Or, I've heard this, I'm going to be dead before it, com before it happens, okay? <laughs> believe it or not. So, like, those trains of thought are typically more traditional, but I would say most of the associations are coming to a... Um, uh, coming to the conclusion that it's better to plan fiscally for long term, it's also better to take care of what you have, which I think we've all learned um, throughout our maturation. So once we get things to a place that are beautiful and top of the line and everything else, like, not top of the line, but to where they're supposed to be, like the wave, we build in preventative maintenance schedules that ensure that you have contractors that take care of the equipment, that do all the work that needs to be done as it comes up. You'll have a roof maintenance program on your roofs once they're replaced that ensure that you have the 20-year warranty on them and that they're always there. The key to those things is no matter what the economy says, you don't stop doing those things. For example, Shanisa made an observation that you don't have a generator preventative maintenance contract, right? And I've heard this from Stephen 50 times. He's like, I told them, I told them, I told them. Not yeah, not them. Not not them. You know, I told them, I told them, I told them. Well, the reality is, is that you save a little bit of money now, and ultimately you pay a lot later, you know? And that's just, with anything that you own, you know that that's how it works. So, um, moving on. The elevator assessment. I apologize. I am not an elevator person, but the elevator consultant couldn't be here, so I get the, um, I get the honor of presenting his information. Uh, the contractor that was hired to do the, the evaluation uh, is Global Elevator Consulting and Inspections. Um, he followed a f the process for bidding out the elevators is very similar to the rest of the work. You engage a consultant. Um, I think we have six of these projects going on now. And this company is, I think, did the wave also. They're almost done with theirs, actually. Um, you evaluate the existing conditions to determine, any, determine what you need to do, create specifications to address the deficiencies, uh, distribute for proposals, receive the proposals to address the deficiencies, review the uh, bids, and select a partner. Now, just to give you a uh, partner to do the, do the work, just to give you an idea from an elevator perspective, you only do one in each building at a time, all right, obviously, so don't think, oh my God, we're not going to have any elevators, okay? Let me just start with that. Um, I was told that the control equipment um, was engineered and installed in 1996. Um, the door operation components were original from 1970. To give you an idea, the, um, the control equipment is on the roof, okay, and that tells it how to go up and down. Um, the door operations make the doors open and close on the floors. Um, current equipment is in poor condition. Your ditch patch equipment, motor control, door operators are obsolete. Now, what that means is whatever equipment that was 
is no longer available from a parts perspective. They're not making it anymore. So, huh? There, I understand. I've heard this a thousand times. Yeah, the, the reality is, is that, okay, there are two types, of, uh, two types of elevators. Hydraulic, which actually has, you cannot install for the most part hydraulic elevators in Florida. Hydraulic elevators have a shaft that goes as deep as it is tall, okay? And then you have hoist elevators where the equipment's on the roof. Now, depending on what manufacturer that you use when you install those elevator components is essentially how long they make those parts, Right, in if you look 1990, 1990, uh, 1970, depending on the manufacturer, that's coming up on 50 years old, um, and nothing from an equipment perspective um, that I know of lasts that long in a building. Um, the modernization. So, what all buildings do is they don't necessarily go in and rip everything out. Right, they usually identify the equipment that needs to be what's quote unquote modernized. Um, Sadly, that's not where you were, um, from what he told me. He said all of the equipment, for the most part, was obsolete or at an age to where it should be replaced. The modernization goals are to improve the system reliability. That'll make sure the equipment goes up and down. Um, stopping accuracy and ride quality. You won't get the jerks. It won't stop short. Um, door operation. The doors won't jerk right when they open. Um, compliance with fire recall requirements. Um, and, know what that is, but I don't need to get into it. Compliance with ADA, um, compliance with existing elevator and building codes, and improve aesthetics. So the aesthetics component is different than the modernization. That's the interior of the cabs. Um, completely separate vendor, typically. Um, the recommendation from the contract or from the vendor partner was replace of existing control systems, replace hoistway entrances so that they're ADA compliant, utilize prepared scope, which he already did, for comprehensive modernization, and then the project will take between 18 and 24 months to complete with one elevator at a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, 24 months. Um, they're usually about four to six months per elevator to complete, just to give you an idea. Um, so this was the status update. We've already went through engaging the professional consultant. He's evaluated the conditions. The specifications were already developed. They were distributed to vendor partners. Those proposals were um, supposed to be received uh, February 11th. And then he's going to review them, put them into a big comparison analysis, and present them to the association, I would guess, in the next 30 days and then we'll be able to decide what contractor will be addressing the elevator deficiencies as we move forward. And yes, ma'am. Sure. So what we're going to do is hold the elevator questions until Shanisa finishes my very nice friends. Uh, just to give anybody, does everybody understand what the turtle lights, why they're there and everything else? Everybody understand it? Yeah, yeah, but it, what it is, is if the lights are the bright color, the turtles mistake them for the, for the moon. And they hatch at night, and they go towards the moon. So if you have the light the opposite direction, they get confused, and they go the wrong direction, and they die. So that's why you have to change the lights to an amber color, usually dimmer, so they don't get confused, just to give you a little insight to our little friends. Uh, and I'll use the same uh, uh, prefaces as Billy did. I'm not an electrical engineer, uh, uh, but uh, I know just enough to be dangerous, but not enough to be technical enough. So uh, uh, the, the, the point is, as, as Billy explained, uh, the, this is a requirement for pretty much every single building that is along the, the, this area. Uh, you need to create a certain light environment that uh, the, the turtles are not going to mistake for, for the moon. The height of the lights, the color of the lights, the, the, the brightness of the lights, all of those things play a, play a role. You received a violation in 2018 from the city stating that your lights are not compliance with this ordinance. Uh, so it indicates that they give you a pretty much which lights, what is not working, what is not in compliance with the ordinance. We received that. Uh, and we need to clear that violation by March 1st, 2019. 
currently, uh, uh, we went through the same process as with the elevator. There was a set of plans. There was bid out. There was a pre-bid meeting. The bids came back. Uh, they were evaluated, and a contractor was selected. The contract was awarded to the company called E-Lightning. E-Lightning, uh, the, the, the system is going to include a, a set of lights, some new poles, uh, some new light poles, uh, a new shield or housing structures, again, to limit the visibility of the lights for, uh, from the, from the uh, beach. Uh, the, the problems with these systems is sometimes uh, the turtle police, as we like to call them, in the, yeah, uh, the wildlife preservation, yeah, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and and us engineers, and sometimes the fire department have a conflict, is because some of those lights are on your pool decks and around your means of egress. So the, the, the means of egress uh, uh, code requires you that you have a certain lighting on those areas uh, so people can see in case of the emergency, and yet you are restricted because you don't want turtles to see them. So it, it creates a lot of conflicts. There are, there are tools and procedures in, 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 in how to resolve that. So uh, right now uh, uh, the plans are uh, in permitting. We had some comments and we addressed those comments and, and the, the, the project is about to start uh, as soon as we receive the, 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 the... Yeah, as soon as we get all the, the paperwork in, in, in order. And again, we have until uh, not not a lot of time, but so that's a brief update on 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 turtle lights. I mean, there is really no the, the the technical aspect of it. I don't know that you know you you wanna on Saturdays sit and speak. Yes. Back to the information that was put in your package. Um, what we're gonna do is this is gonna be the way that we consistently update you. So if you get familiar with this, you'll see it consistently. It'll continue to grow as we go through the project. On the second page, it says preparation of scope of work and vendor criteria for public bid. That's the stage that we're at currently. And then it says preparation of bid specification and, go and documents. So that process is ongoing and will be completed approximately April 1st. Just to give you a timeline is how we move forward. So the specifications that Shanisa will be working on should be completed April 1st. The bid package that will be submitted to the vendors that potentially could be your partner to do the different components in the building will be distributed approximately April 15th. And then we should have the, um, the opportunity to open the closed bids in a public meeting on June 1st of 2019. Um, Obviously, from there, we'll be able to build out the rest of the um, dates, and we'll also be able to build out a little more thorough of the information under each category, as you can see above. And all of the information is always available online. So I think that concludes the presentation. Yes. If there's any questions, yes, sir. How much is the service available? How much reserve is available for this project? Um, I would prefer to have that conversation when we understand the scope. I, I, I understand. I mean, right now I don't have the financials in front of me, so I don't want to say there's 400,000. It, and it really depends on how much you want to use. So it doesn't matter if it's a million, 400,000, 600,000. How much money do you have in your reserve account? There's 1.4 million in the reserve. Okay, there's three components. Let me just, I have them in front of me. Okay, so the reserve haven't been revised since 2005. After all those projects, we'll revise the, re the reserve component. So today, the three components, and correct me, Stephen, so there is a painting, there's a roof, and a paving. Okay, so legally, we cannot use the money for something else. So we cannot use paving money for elevators. So there's 1.4, about 4 to 22,000 for the painting, and that's the uh, December uh, 31st number, okay? So 300,000 for the roof, 310 for the roof. So 422 for the paint, 310 for the roof, and about 667 for the paving. That's what's guaranteeing the reserve, 1.4, okay? Is that clear? Pardon? Thank you. Uh, 
One question for the board. You've obviously done a huge amount of work yes. in the assessment. Thank you. And a comment was made very early on. We have elections coming up. I hope you'll answer this. Do all of you plan to run for re-election? I, for one, feel yes. continuity is critical for this, and I'm hoping you'll all stick with it. I think it's clear we're coming back all five together. You, in your package, we give you a one pager of us. We totally intend to stay together and continue together. So we need your help, we need your support, and I would like to continue working with the future with you guys. So we're not looking in the past, we're looking for the future. Fantastic. There was one gentleman over here first, then I'll come to you. Um, I understand that we, we haven't got pricing for each individual items, and, and, but I'm wondering, do we have a guesstimate on, on what's the magnitude of work? Or I mean a dollar amount guesstimate? Um, I really don't want to do that. I don't think it's fair to you to do that. I mean, the reality is, I mean, how much, how much could the complete cost of the project be? I, I, I really don't want to give you that. I, I could tell you what I would do if I were you, okay, is take your percentage of ownership, take $5 million times that number, $10 million times that number, $15 million times that number, and $20 million times that number. It won't be the last one, I promise you, okay? But that'll give you some scope. Um, I can also tell you we're really good at financing these things. So, you know, ultimately it's not like you're gonna be, you're gonna have to pay a huge check up front. Um, it, there's just certain components of the job right now that could be, for example, in mechanical equipment. I couldn't guess how much that's gonna be because I don't know the equipment with, um, means and methods are very important. For example, I don't know if any of you were here when we did the Aquarius cooling tower. We had the helicopter that brrrr, right? So, you know, that's a lot more expensive than a crane, for example. And the city wouldn't let us use a crane because of how it was either on the beach or on the other side of the road. So there's a lot of variables with those types of things. Joe again, 320, hello. A quick question. Um, after all this work is done and we put all the mechanical equipment in, can you set up a service uh, program that we can follow? You know, because new equipment is going to evolve. It has new technology, and we're going to need to be trained on that. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, one of the things that we as Atlantic Pacific do when new equipment is installed is the manufacturer actually prescribes the preventative maintenance um, required to facilitate the continuance of the warranty. Um, and then we engage the contractor that does the installation to provide that work for the future years. Usually we get at least the first year, maybe the second included um, in the install, but we have that contractor constantly do it. For example, Wave and Aquarius have the same contractors that did the install doing all of the preventative maintenance at the contract price that we in initially um, negotiated. That way we don't have any issues with, you know, he said, she said, this person, that person, they did this wrong, they didn't do this right. And the same is going to apply to the roof. The part of maintaining your warranty on the roof is an annual inspection and an annual service contract. So once you have the new roof, you have to have a service contract with a company. It's going to come here, do the roof, inspect all of that, and make sure it's in good working condition, patch up if something needs to be patched up, and so on. Another thing why exterior of the building and the roof is important from this perspective uh, uh, is, for example, when, you have, when there is an IRMA claim, there are a lot of condominiums out there that claimed roof damages. However, nobody had a, uh, a maintenance contract on the roof and nobody could provide to the insurance company the actual condition of the roof before the hurricane and makes the claim so much more difficult. But if you have a good standing uh, maintenance inspection log on the roof and there is a hurricane and something happens with the roof and you want to claim insurance, you can pull out the record and say, hey, listen, these people were here on August 1st and they gave it a clean bill of health and look at it today. And it helps in some of these things. On the exterior of the building, there is really no maintenance per se, except for timely painting. You are on the beach, uh, eight years is absolutely the maximum where you should have the spend, no matter what paint you get out there. They are now selling paints, 15 year warranty, you know, and all of that. That's, that's all nice and dandy, uh, but the thing is, 
the exposure you're getting from all sides on both of the buildings is such that you want to think proactively rather than reactively. Um, I don't see any more hands, so I'll turn it back over to the board of directors, I guess to say good night, goodbye. <laughs> Once again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here. I know that it's been probably what almost two and a half hours, but I appreciate you taking the time. This is very important for each and every one of you. Everything will be uploaded on the website. You'll have, the two, like I said earlier, the 2008 report that you probably haven't seen, and the 2018 every Emmy, the mechanical, the electrical, and the plumbing report. The um, elevator report will be there too. Remember, on the website, you have all your financials are there. Every monthly financial is there. Everything, every estimate is there. There's a lot of information on that website. I encourage you to get your username and password so that, you know, we want to be in the name of tra transparency. We want to be transparent to the unit owners, okay? So thank you for coming and have to enjoy the rest of your day.